My own family, that is the direct family, with all together 15 of us. And out of these 15, uh, only three of us left. My oldest brother was poisoned by Indonesian intelligence. I lost two oldest brothers, one brother-in-law, and three sons. My brothers killed and executed in, in front of my eyes by the Indonesian military. East Timor is a tiny country just 400 miles to the north of Australia. A Portuguese colony for more than 400 years, East Timor was invaded in 1975 by Indonesia, the fifth largest nation in the world, led by a military dictatorship. Indonesia has no historical nor legal claim to East Timor, yet its brutal occupation has met with mostly silence from the world's leading governments and international agencies. What happened here 18 years ago happened mostly in secret, and this filming is being done in secret without the approval or knowledge of the Indonesian authorities. Journalists and independent observers are not welcome in East Timor. Two Australian television teams, including two Britons, were murdered here in 1975 by the Indonesian army for trying to breach the wall of silence that the regime in Jakarta and its Western allies had built around East Timor. As a result of the Indonesian invasion and occupation, some 200,000 people died here. That's a third of the population, or proportionately more than were killed in Cambodia under Pol Pot. They were killed resisting the invasion. They were murdered without reason. They died in concentration camps, and they starved. Perhaps genocide is too often used these days, but by any standards, that's what's happened here. And it happened mostly beyond the reach of the TV camera and the satellite dish, and with the connivance and complicity of Western governments, the same governments that were prepared to go to war against Saddam Hussein, but were not prepared in almost parallel circumstances to stop a rapacious invader that had broken every provision in the United Nations Charter and had defied no less than 10 United Nations sanctioning resolutions calling on it to withdraw from East Timor. We should keep our heads down, said a British ambassador to Indonesia, and let matters take their course. Letting matters take their course, the governments of Britain, the United States, Australia and others supplied the means by which the regime in Jakarta has bled East Timor. This film is the story of that bleeding and of a cover-up that tells us much about the selectivity and aims of great power and how the modern world is ordered. que os indonesios vão fazendo para acabar com o povo timorense de uma forma ou de outra. Terror que vai matando as pessoas. Se não vier ajuda, se o mundo internacional não se interessar em nós, seremos esmagados pelo, pela Indonésia. Culturalmente, estamos a moralmente e fisicamente. My responsibility is to my own people and to my own constituents. And uh, I don't really fill my mind much with what one set of foreigners is doing to another. One has to say, what is it that's so dreadfully special about East Timor to the people here? On 13 December 1983, the military took my brothers and kill in front of my eyes and they pull out after they kill they pull out their heart and show to us that's a dirty heart now he must agree the integration 
Indonesian government has played a strategy of not allowing people to go into East Timor. No tourists, no cameras, no journalists were allowed in. But the people of East Timor themselves have suffered so much that you can see it through their eyes. There is a, a fear. All, the eye says it all. You don't have to talk to the people of East Timor. Even the little children shows in their eyes, in their face, that they never smile. There's not one single family that has not lost a member of their family. They always have a story to say uh, in terms of women being raped or, or um, a young boy would be just snatched from his house and never been able to see it again. And this kind of uh, torture has constantly happened and it is on a daily basis. Timor is a land of crosses, crosses etched against the sky, crosses on peaks, crosses on hillsides. This is the grave of just one family, all killed on the same day. The people in East Timor themselves call it, and we call it, the biggest prison island in the world. That is what it is. It's, it's a hell. Can you give me an idea of what it was like to grow up in East Timor in those years before the invasion? Well, it was a um, typical island life um, in which people live very um, happily, uh, in a friendly, uh, uh, people go about their business uh, without worrying about authorities or guns. Even though we were ruled by uh, a foreign power, which was Portuguese uh, then, uh, but Portuguese very much left people alone in, in traditional lives. Uh, they didn't um, do what um, I mean, Indonesia have done in the last 18 years. Not once ever in all my adult life I witnessed a racial incident. So East Timor was in fact under the Portuguese, was a relatively uh, happy country. The Portuguese also had uh, a benign attitude towards the East Timorese. You might describe it benign neglect. Uh, I would say uh, they treated the people uh, reasonably. Uh, they never interfered with the people in the mountains. Not so much, maybe out of a uh, intellectual, anthropological uh, understanding of native culture, but largely because of the Portuguese very Mediterranean uh, laziness, uh, neglect, laissez-faire. So the people were quite happy in the mountains. Here lies the ruins of the Portuguese Empire in Timor. The Indonesian regime has sought to justify its occupation of this country on grounds of what it calls common brotherhood. In fact, the East Timorese have virtually nothing in common with Indonesia. They have a different language and culture, and whereas Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world, the East Timorese are Catholic and animist. Even their colonial experience was different, with the Portuguese Latinizing East Timor and setting it distinctly apart from the experiences of the Dutch colonies that became Indonesia. Of course, some things never change, like the propaganda of naked aggression. When the Germans overran and occupied most of Europe, they too used the term common brotherhood. This was Indonesia in the mid-1960s. Books were burned and popular democracy crushed when General Suharto came to power. In the West, Indonesia was seen as an investor's paradise, a huge market, rich in oil and other natural resources. Richard Nixon called Indonesia the greatest prize in Southeast Asia. Suharto and his generals were welcome to the free world. This is Indonesia today. These people are secretly unearthing a mass grave of victims of Suharto's military coup. An estimated half a million of his own people were killed, most of them landless peasants accused of being communists. Declassified documents show that the United States actively supported the Indonesian generals. The American ambassador assured them that Washington is sympathetic with and admiring of what the army is doing. These people are finding the bones of relatives whose murder almost 30 years ago was the precursor for the coming genocide 
in East Timor. In September 1974, the Australian Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam, flew to Indonesia to meet General Suharto. Whitlam regarded good relations with Indonesia as vital to Australia's strategic and economic interests in Asia. Whitlam had supported the rights of small nations all over the world, but he believed East Timor was different. According to journalists briefed by Australian officials, Whitlam's clear signal to Suharto was that East Timor should become part of Indonesia. Whitlam believed, said the Sydney Morning Herald, that an independent Timor would be an unviable state and a potential threat to the area. During those meetings, uh, Mr Whitlam uh, really made three things fairly clear. One was that uh, when East Timor came to be decolonised, uh, he thought it would be logical and sensible for it to become part of Indonesia because, after all, the Indonesian archipelago already surrounded it. Secondly, he uh, put the view that that should be achieved through an act of self-determination and had in mind, I think, a period of, sort of education preparation. And thirdly, he made it also plain that if, uh, if the situation did deteriorate, uh, uh, force should not be used. Weren't the East Timorese, as far as Western governments were concerned, and especially Australia, simply expendable? Not as far as Australia was concerned. Australia has a considerable debt to the East Timorese, which goes back to World War II. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why it was a, an agonising situation for Australia. I would agree with you that it was somewhat... Uh, the East Timorese were probably seen as expendable by some of the hard-nosed... Uh, major power brokers, if you like. More than a year before the invasion took place, we did know that an organisation had been formed which was designed to bring about the integration of East Timor regardless of the wishes of the people. It was actually part of the operations of this Operasi Commodore, this subversive operation set up in late 1974. In October 1974, this man, General Benny Madani, launched a conspiracy with three other generals close to Suharto. It was Operation Komodo. The objective was to destroy East Timor's growing independence movement, which had produced three political groups and promised a flourishing democracy. In January 1975, the main nationalist party, Fretilin, and its more conservative opponents, UDT, formed a coalition which had one aim, independence. But Indonesian agents infiltrated the coalition, undermining it and finally destroying it. This led to civil war. By now, the Portuguese had stepped aside. After two weeks of fighting, which had cost an estimated 1,500 lives, Fretilin emerged the clear winner and commanded the support of the majority of the population. They readily recognised and repeatedly told me that uh, they must have the Portuguese come back and continue with decolonisation. When the Indonesians began their military intervention, there was no civil war, there was no contest of Fretland control in any part of East Timor. That was a lie that kept coming out from Jakarta. It was actually part of the operations of this Operasi Commodore. The small nation was left to defend itself completely on its own. Western intelligence knew in advance every move the Indonesians made through a top secret monitoring base near Darwin. 
On September the 4th, the CIA reported to Washington, two Indonesian special forces groups have entered Portuguese Timor. And on September the 17th, Jakarta is now sending guerrillas to provoke incidents that provide an excuse to invade. We are appealing not only to Australia, but to all democratic forces in the world to stop the Indonesian uh, violation of our territory. It is, a, it is a criminal attempt, a criminal act that should be stopped immediately by all democratic countries in the world. You knew in advance, didn't you, that the Indonesian invasion was going to happen, and you forewarned... Well, uh, we say knew in advance, uh, from, from sort of assessing the situation as it was developing, I uh, did come to the conclusion, as did a number of other ambassadors in Jakarta in 1975, that Indonesian intervention was inevitable in these circumstances. This is Greg Shackleton, a television journalist from Channel 7 Australia. He and his crew, and another Australian crew from Channel 9, set out to get proof that the Indonesian invasion had secretly begun. There were five of them, including two Britons. If they could expose Indonesia's clandestine operation, international pressure might stop it. They drove to the coastal town of Balibo, where Indonesian ships had been sighted. This was Greg Shackleton's last report, the day before he was murdered. Why, they ask, are the Indonesians invading us? Why, they ask, if the Indonesians believe that Fretland is communist, do they not send a delegation to Dili to find out? Why, they ask, are the Australians not helping us? When the Japanese invaded, they did help us. Why, they ask, are the Portuguese not helping us? We're still a Portuguese colony. Who, they ask, will pay for the terrible damage to our homes? We look like being the last people left in the town. In the meantime, we've daubed our house with the word Australia in red and the Australian flag. We're hoping it will afford us some protection. This is Greg Shackleton for Seven National News at Bali Bowl. There's uh, witnesses who've said they heard the Australian journalist shouting, Australian journalist non-combat. Then they said they heard fire and there was no more what sound. What happened to Greg and his companions? I don't know whether it happened to Greg or which of the five, but the majority of them were hung up by their feet. Their sexual organs were removed and pushed into their mouths. They were stabbed with the short throwing knives that the Indonesian soldiers carry and it isn't known whether they asphyxiated or whether they bled to death or whether some of them got stabbed in the heart and died quickly. The feeling was that because this is quite a common way to punish people in East Timor, bodies are often found this way and so the Timorese have a fair idea that it takes a long time. They asphyxiate usually. Did the Australian government uh, ever protest to the Indonesian government for the deaths of, uh, they claim of Greg they did. and his companions? They claim that they, that they asked... Publicly, publicly protest. No, they asked diplomatic questions, which allowed them to get diplomatic answers. Well, uh, I certainly delivered protests as ambassador at the time. I guess they're not at the level of the Prime Minister, of course, but... But isn't that pretty serious when two television crews are gunned down by Indonesians and in this country no one stands up, the leader of the country doesn't stand up and protests in the most vigorous language to those who've done it? Well, uh, let me say that at that time, this was October 1975, uh, first of all, there was considerable uncertainty in the early days about the facts, about how they died. Uh, and um, there was there's now been I think you know there's now been plenty of released intelligence documentation that uh, suggests very strongly that uh, Australia like the other Western powers knew exactly what was going on and uh, and knew what had happened to these uh, journalists within uh, hours uh, of uh, what had happened to we them. knew within uh I don't know whether it was ours, but within days anyway, that they'd been killed. Um, I'm not, even to this day, precisely sure what happened, except they're very unwise to be where they were. It subsequently proved to be unwise. 
But Greg would never have expected to be murdered because of the very good relationship that people like Walcott was very busy proclaiming. That would be the last thing Greg would have expected to happen. He had no... Why would they kill them? Well, of course, what he didn't know was that they had every intention of invading East Timor. And they didn't want the world to know. It's clear that Western governments knew exactly what the Indonesians were planning. Here's a selection of secret diplomatic messages sent from Jakarta by the ambassadors of Britain, Australia and the United States. The British ambassador, Sir John Archibald Ford, cabled, It is in Britain's interest that Indonesia absorb their territory as soon and unobtrusively as possible, and when it comes to the crunch, we should keep our heads down. The Australian ambassador, Richard Walcott, cabled his government, although we know it's not true, the formal position of the Indonesian government is that there is no Indonesian military intervention in East Timor. He meant, of course, that the Indonesians were lying, although he strongly advised his government not to question the lie. We should act, he cabled, in a way designed to minimise the public impact in Australia and show private understanding to the Indonesians of their problem. The American ambassador noted simply that he hoped the Indonesians would be effective, quick and not use our equipment. By December 1975, the countdown to the invasion of East Timor was in its final stages. President Gerald Ford and his Secretary of State Henry Kissinger arrived in Indonesia on December the 5th on a visit described by a State Department official as the Big Wink. As an example of being their certain knowledge of what was about to happen, the embassy staff were taking unusual measures to plan as many photo and visual opportunities to present Ford and Suharto together, uh, demonstrating unlimited support for Suharto and the Indonesian government. And I thought, wait a minute, something is seriously wrong here. I joined CIA many years ago in the early 60s uh, because I was one of these fellows who thought uh, instead of uh, complaining about what was going on in the world and doing nothing about it, uh, you might be able to accomplish something good. And when I was in this situation in Indonesia, what I saw instead was that my own government was very much involved in uh, what was going on in East Timor and that what was going on was not good. Uh, you can be 100% certain that Suharto was explicitly given the green light to do what he did. The Americans persuaded the Indonesians to delay the invasion until after the president had left. And on December the 7th, as the presidential jet climbed out of Indonesian airspace, the bloodbath began. The 
first days, hundreds and hundreds of people were simply massacred upon the Indonesian troop arrival in Dili. Ela foi morta do, com bombardeamento que os indonesios atacaram aquela zona de Jumalá e Suai, um, 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 um intenso bombardeamento, então foi este laço é que matou a minha filha com 21 anos. E muito mais gente feridos, mortos com bombardeamento dos indonesios. These are the hulks of Indonesian landing craft, left as stark reminders to the population on the beach in the center of Dili. When the Indonesians landed here, they began an operation that has been compared in its savagery with Pol Pot's takeover of Cambodia. Hundreds of people were gunned down in the streets, in schools, in shops, in their homes, in the hospital. Live grenades were thrown into houses, women and girls were raped in front of their families. The Indonesian troops had been told that the East Timorese were communists and primitives who threatened the very existence of Indonesia itself. The strategy was clearly to terrorize an entire nation. We were learning about it from hard, firm reports from people on the scene in East Timor. Uh, reports of uh, people being herded into uh, school buildings by Indonesian soldiers uh, with the buildings set on fire and uh, anyone trying to get out being shot, but most of the people being burned alive. Uh, people being herded into fields and machine gunned. People being hunted down in the mountains, so anyone out there was in what amounted to a free fire zone. There was also a systematic pattern to the terror. To many Timorese, their glistening ocean is still known as the Sea of Blood. People were brought here to die in groups, and as in Cambodia, often the first to die were the educated, public officials, teachers, students, nurses. One eyewitness reported the words of an Indonesian officer who, when asked to justify the mass killing of women and children, said, when you clean the fields, don't you kill all the snakes, both large and small. Out of our clan, which at that time in 74, as I, as I know it, as I knew then, uh, was out of uh, 5,000. And um, the number have reduced to about over 500. From 5,000 to yes, 500? Yes, It's very, very reduced. That's extraordinary slaughter it of is, people. It is. Uh, and there was a massive, massive bombardment that took place. People even said that the whole rock became white uh, because all the trees and grass that grow on the rocks were all blown up. We were providing most of the weaponry, helicopters, logistical support, food, uniforms, ammunition, all the expendables that the Indonesians needed to conduct this war. When Henry Kissinger returned to Washington, he summoned his senior aides. According to the minutes of that meeting, Kissinger expressed his fear that the Congress and public would find out about his complicity with the Suharto regime. Kissinger, on the Timor thing, that will leak in three months and it will come out that Kissinger overruled his pristine bureaucrats and violated the law. How many people know about this? Staff member, three. Kissinger, plus everybody in this meeting, everything on paper will be used against me. Can't we construe a communist government in the middle of Indonesia as self-defense? He gave orders that shipments of American arms be stopped quietly, but secretly started again the next month. In fact, as the killings increased in East Timor, American arms shipments doubled. As the month went by, uh, the war went on. Uh, one of my sister, Maria Zinha, by then nine, uh, 17 years old in 1977, uh, was killed during an air raid carried out by the Indonesian Air Force using uh, Bronco aircraft. Two American supply Bronco aircraft nose dive uh, to a village uh, somewhere in the remote countryside uh, and open fire on the village. Uh, at that particular moment, there were no guerrilla troops there, only civilian population. My sister was there. She was running the local school. She and the 20 kids at least were killed. Yeah! 
In 1981, the Indonesian military force marched tens of thousands of people at gunpoint in human chains across the island. This was known as the Fence of Legs. The aim was to flush out Fretland guerrillas, with Indonesian troops following on behind and pursuing them into human corrals where they could be captured or killed. Thousands of civilians died in the operation, including children and old people. Durante a operação de limpeza, o que se via que as pessoas as mortas, já, tanto os corpos, os cadáveres já tinham uma outra forma, que se não podia saber como é que eles mataram e, e por que é que eles mataram. Ah, o que é certo é que os guerrilheiros, segundo algumas fotografias que os próprios comandos, os comandantes ah, tiraram, fotografaram, e que foram mortos, alguns foram ah, mortos à facada, foram torturados aos poucos até morrerem, alguns foram decapitados e golados, e alguns foram um, atados e cortados aos pedaços e até castrados, ah, e, e até mulheres foram violadas à frente dos, dos, For dos two maridos. Years there was virtually a news blackout over events in East Timor. Then two nuns in Portugal received this letter from a priest in East Timor. The invaders, he wrote, have intensified their attacks in the three classic ways, from land, sea and air. The bombers do not stop. Hundreds die every day. The bodies of the victims become food for carnivorous birds. Villages have been completely destroyed. The barbarities understandable in the Middle Ages, justifiable in the Stone Age, are an organized evil that has spread deep roots in East Timor. The terror of arbitrary imprisonment is our daily bread. I am on the persona non grata list, and any day I could disappear. Fretland soldiers who give themselves up are disposed of. For them, there is no prison. Genocide will come soon. On the top of, of the mountain was a space. Uh, was there many of bones on the top of uh, each other? And uh, Jose said, "Oh, please pray, Fatima. This is um, uh, our family's uh, part of our family died here. Uh, was a massacre here, and it's not um, bones from animals. They are uh, our family." So you come across the bones of people who belong to your family. That's right. How yes. many people were, were there? How many? The bones of how many people? Oh my God, that was many. I believe that about uh, uh, 50 people. These are rare pictures of Fretland These guerrillas are rare. still fighting on after 18 years. We filmed them under the noses of the Indonesian army, which claims to control all of East Timor. They get no outside help from any government. All their weapons are captured from the Indonesians. Some have not seen their families for years, and every man here has lost members of his family. Delphine became a guerrilla after witnessing one of the most notorious massacres. As populações com, com, começaram a voltar à vila e os javas foram mat, mataram todos os, os homens, os velhos e os juventudes ali na na ribeira de Betuco. São 60 e 66. 66 pessoas, só daí saíram dois irmãos, um ainda está vivo, um, 
um ainda está vivendo junto de nós em, no mato e um ainda um já rendeu outra vez. Entrou outra vez na vida. E as mulheres, o que aconteceu com elas? E as mulheres foram perseguidas pelos javas e violadas e foram massacrados e mataram tantas. The village of Kararas used to be here until it was razed to the ground by the Indonesians. That is uh, the village that in 1983, more or less 400 of population, 400 of population were killed by Indonesian troops. They were all buried here in a mass grave. There is no any cross. They put only the stones and bamboos because the uh, population is uh, afraid that when they put uh, a cross here or a mark here, Indonesian troops will arrest the person who put cross here. This is an extraordinary list of almost 300 of those murdered in this one village during the summer of 1983. It is evidence of a crime against humanity reminiscent of the Nazis in occupied Europe. The list was compiled by the church in a meticulous handwritten script that records the name, age, date and place of every death of every victim as well as the Indonesian battalion responsible for each murder. Note the ages and how young they are and the names of whole families. The women who survived were brought here to what is known as the village of the widows. Another form of population control is contraception, given without the permission or knowledge of women, especially the enforced use of the contraceptive drug Depo-Provera. People are forced to have deeper provera injections. For example, uh, there were school girls, teenagers, uh, who were injected with deeper provera so that they don't have babies anymore. And what uh, they were told was that there was a, some kind of uh, anti-tetanus injection. This doctor went to East Timor on our behalf and secretly investigated the use of enforced birth control. Well, I found in one clinic a very large number of people were uh, being given birth control, I think out of all proportion to the other efforts that were being made, medical efforts that were being made. And I heard many people say that uh, the birth control injection was being given without any explanation uh, to the people who were receiving it uh, as to what it was. What are they injected with? Uh, Depo Provera, and uh, again, uh, one clinic claimed uh, to have 500 women uh, being injected, and I found that a very large number, given that very little else seemed to be going on at the clinic. In 1983, General Sahato received a United Nations Prize for his support for family planning. The prize came with a cheque for $12,000. The many pregnant women would not, would not dare to go to Indonesian hospitals or Indonesian doctors because those doctors would make sure that she loses the baby. This is part of the genocide. East Timor had a population according to the best rolls of about 688,000 and it was growing at just on 2% per annum. That means today East Timor ought to be, just assuming it didn't grow any faster, which should have a population of about 980,000 or more, almost a million. The Timorese population, if we look at the recent Indonesian census, is at the most probably 650,000. It's incredible and it, it's worse than Kampuchea. Dr. Suarez, 
Would you agree that what has happened in East Timor has amounted to genocide? Sem dúvida. Foram mortas milhares e milhares, centenas de milhares de pessoas e outras foram transportadas à força para outras ilhas e, pela mesma maneira que foram introduzidas no território, à força no território de Timor-Leste, eh, eh, indonésios vindos de outras ilhas. Portanto, houve aqui uma posição de força e um verdadeiro genocídio, a tentativa, a tentativa a frio de destruição de um povo na sua identidade mais profunda, isto é, nos seus hábitos, tradições, língua e religião. Yes, as happens in everywhere, including Western countries. You know what I'm referring to. Uh, there are some, sometimes abuses of the uh, uh, military authority or uh, by government authorities, but uh, it is the commitment of the government to address this question and to punish those responsible. I don't know uh, why you ask these questions. Is it, is it simply to uh, promote uh, the bad image of Indonesia, or is it a question that will clarify uh, the situation vis-à-vis -vis, uh, the accusations that was made, uh, that well, were made? Are, these are, I ask them because they are accusations made by people uh, across the spectrum from, uh, as I mentioned, the president of Portugal, and he said that what Indonesia had done in Timor was genocide. Well, I reject, absolutely I reject that the uh, accusations. We drove through what the Indonesians call military control areas, where people were forcibly moved as a means of separating them from the resistance. The dislocation caused by camps like this has struck at the very roots of Timorese society. People are subjected to a form of brainwashing that extols Suharto's new order, and in schools all over East Timor, the Timorese language is banned. While immigrants are brought from Indonesia, to run the island's economy and to further dilute the Timorese population. When you move people away from their sacred land, away from places where they live for thousands of years, into uh, lower areas infested by mosquito, they are not able to move out of those camps to cultivate, for instance. There is a curfew, and because they cannot cultivate, there is no food, and there is no food, they die. In the late 1970s and early 80s, famine claimed many thousands of lives in resettlement camps where people were denied adequate land to grow food. Although we saw no starvation, a great many people were terribly malnourished. While the massacres continued, the agents of great power worked hard to maintain the silence. In January 1976, the American ambassador to the United Nations, Daniel Moynihan, sent a secret cable to Henry Kissinger boasting of the considerable progress he was making in blocking UN action on East Timor. Later, Moynihan wrote, the Department of State desired that the United Nations prove utterly ineffective. This task was given to me and I carried it through with no inconsiderable success. This is the Hotel Flamboyant in the old Portuguese resort town of Bacau, where official visitors were often brought to admire the peacefulness of East Timor under Indonesian rule. What they weren't told, of course, was that the Hotel Flamboyant was used by the military as a torture place. There is extensive official documentation describing how Indonesian soldiers were taught to dress and behave as civilians, pretending to be Timorese whose language they didn't speak, even playing the part of happy, uncomplaining prisoners. 
in comfortable prisons that of course didn't exist. There are also documents showing that torture was officially sanctioned with established procedures for the torturer. One such manual is entitled Guiding the Village Comprehensively and lists the do's and don'ts of torture. And here they are. Avoid taking photographs showing torture in progress and when people are being subjected to electric current and when they have been stripped naked, etc. Remember not to have photographs developed outside East Timor, which could then be made available to the public by irresponsible elements. Interrogation should be repeated over and over again until the correct conclusion is drawn. Jose Amarin, now in exile, was forced as a boy to watch his father being tortured. I was asked to come in order, all of us, to see my father, the time when he was tortured. And then he was tortured by Indonesian. We are looking at the action and we are warned by the Indonesians that, look, if you kids, for the coming time being, you follow the example of your father, you are against the Indonesians, you will have the same sort like, like your father. What did they do to your father? They tortured him for several times. What did they do? Uh, they punched him and beaten him and put their fingers to manipulate their stomach and intestines of my father because usually the Indonesian troops are trained with uh, they call silat or karate and they are used usually to this kind of uh, torture and they put their fingers to the stomach of my father and starting how can I say in English like this These are Hawk ground attack aircraft, made by British Aerospace and one of the fastest selling British weapons in the world. In 1978, at the height of the genocide, David Owen, Foreign Secretary in the Labour government, agreed to sell the Hawk to Indonesia. From then on, the British establishment played court to the Suharto regime, while selling it more Hawk aircraft, more missiles, helicopters, frigates, armoured vehicles, mine disposal equipment, military communications and a fully equipped Institute of Technology for the Indonesian Army, Margaret Thatcher received an award for the promotion of technology. She told her Indonesian audience, I am proud to be one of you. In 1991, the government of John Major urged its European partners to cut aid to regimes that violated human rights. In the same year, Major shook hands with Indonesia's weapons chief, B.J. Habibi. Later, the government announced a billion pound deal for more Hawk aircraft, despite the devastation they were causing. The um, point of selling Hawk aircraft to Indonesia is to give jobs to people in this country. And there is no doubt in my mind that there is nothing that a Hawk aircraft can do to suppress the people in East Timor. It is not an aircraft that is suitable for that purpose and we have guarantees from the Indonesians that they would not be used for internal suppression. Alan Clark, you, you were Minister of Defence when the sale of Hawk aircraft were being negotiated and finalised with Indonesia and your colleagues have talked about getting guarantees from the Indonesians that the hawks would not be used for oppressive purposes against civilians and in fact in East Timor. I mean, what, what exactly are these guarantees? I mean, that's really what I'm trying well, to I work never out. Asked, I never asked for guarantees of that kind. That must have been something that the Foreign Office did um, before the IDC or whatever it was, that, that mm. uh, whatever committee it is that considers uh, so guarantees possible contract. or not? I mean, uh, would you 
Would you say getting guarantees from a government like the Indonesian government? Uh, oh, a guarantee, is, a guarantee is worthless from any government as far as I'm concerned. I, mean, mm. I wouldn't even bother with it, but it's, mm. you may want it, uh, it may look um, good in the formula, you know. That's a Foreign Office matter, not an MAD matter. Mm. We'd never ask someone for guarantees. Mm. But it wasn't just a Foreign Office matter, it was the Ministry of Defence that also accepted the guarantees. That is a training aeroplane. The ability of the aircraft to carry weapons has been improved. Yeah. Uh, the weight of uh, weapons that can be carried has been increased, and the, as you see, the wide range of weapons that it can carry uh, is quite impressive. But the government have said that the version of the planes the Indonesians are buying is just a trainer and won't be used against the Timorese. Well, it's, it's a question we look at uh, very carefully, but I promise you, uh, we put under the most uh, searching uh, analysis the use to which uh, equipments that we sell will be put. And we are quite confident that the Indonesians will, will use our, our Hawks for jet training for advanced jet training, which is why they were acquired in the first place. I mean, as far as the Hawks were concerned, uh, there was a great deal of talk from all the ministries in British aerospace that they were merely trainers. I mean, that, that, a lot has been made of that. No, they weren't telling the truth. Well, that's just a label you put on this. And they are trainers. You said merely trainers. They're, they're, the Hawks are training aircraft. Um, but it's actually ex an exceptionally effective aircraft and can be used in a whole variety of different roles. Well, it can be easily converted too, uh, as the Indonesian's Mr. Habibi, a man you know, uh, yes. he said that, uh, oh yes, it's a training aircraft uh, with his tongue in his cheek, but we can easily convert it, in effect. Sure, it can, it can be converted anyway. The, the Hawk is, is dual use with a capital D. In fact, part of the deal with Indonesia is conversion training to a light attack aircraft and Indonesia's weapons chief, Habibi, has made it clear the Hawk, he said, will be used not only to train pilots, but for ground attack. The first time I saw two uh, jet fighters, I was surprised. I realized that they were Hawk because we only saw Bronco. You know, they flew over us. Ten minutes after we heard, you know, that um, strong blast a bomb and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, machine gun. Da, 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 boom. A government minister, Baroness Chorka, told Parliament that British aid was helping the poor of Indonesia. In fact, half of all aid to Indonesia is linked to trade, and much of that is tied to weapons. This is a list of British companies selling weapons or war-related equipment to the Indonesian dictatorship. In April 1993, shortly before the sale of Hawk aircraft was announced, the Foreign Secretary, Douglas Hurd, flew to Jakarta and gave Suharto £65 million in so-called soft loans. Hurd assured the regime that Western values on human rights could not be exported to Indonesia. There were cultural and economic differences, he said, and referred to Indonesia's recognition of basic freedom. Uh, on the question of uh, human rights, for instance, although we have a different views, but I think among the easy countries, uh, United Kingdom is one of the most uh, uh, ready to understand our position and, and to express uh, uh, support uh, when it is possible. Did it ever bother you personally that this British equipment was causing such mayhem and human suffering? No, not as right as. Never entered my head. I mean, I, you tell me that this was happening. I, I didn't uh, hear about it well, or know about it. Well, even if I hadn't told it was happening, the fact that we supply highly effective equipment to a regime like that then is not a consideration as far as you're concerned. Not it's not right. a personal consideration. No. 
Not at all. I asked the question because you, I've, I read that you were a, a, a vegetarian mm. uh, and you quite uh, seriously and uh, concerned about the way animals are killed. Yeah. Doesn't that concern uh, extend to the way humans, albeit foreigners, are killed? Curiously not, no. The resistance leader, Connie Santana, has uh, reported to me for uh, several months now there is a major offensive going on involving hundreds and hundreds of Indonesian troops throughout the country with helicopter, with aircraft, including the Hawks, in a major attempt to completely eradicate uh, the guerrilla in, in East Timor. Aviões Hawk, the fabric of English, tem atuado contra a população in defesa. Tem lançado bombas, tem lançado morteiro, bom, 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 bombas assassinas contra populações indefesas, tem assassinado populações indefesas. We put it to Sir Alan Thomas, head of defence sales, that the Hawks were not merely for training and had been used against the people of East Timor. We keep a very close watch on what our friends and allies are doing at all times, and uh, there's no evidence of what you suggest. I can distinguish uh, from the nose of the Hawks and Skyhawks, F-15, F-16 and the Broncos. I saw two Hawks on the ground along the airport of Baucau and I asked people, what about these Hawks? And they said, well, why are you surprised? These Hawks are bombing the mountains of Mativian every day. It should be remembered that oppression was never part of the vision of those who fought and died to free Indonesia from European imperialism. Their struggle for independence from the Dutch produced great popular movements for democracy and social justice. For 14 years, Indonesia had one of the freest parliamentary democracies in the world. Today, many Indonesians understand this. The slaughter in East Timor is unworthy of such a nation. One of the biggest prizes for the West is the Timor Gap Oil Treaty between Indonesia and Australia, which allows foreign companies to exploit the huge oil and gas reserves in the seabed off East Timor. Portugal has taken Australia to the World Court over the legality of the treaty. According to Professor Roger Clark, a world authority on international law, the treaty makes the Australian government a receiver of stolen property. This is Australian Foreign Affairs Minister Gareth Evans and Indonesian Foreign Minister Ali Alatas. They're flying over the oil fields of Timor, toasting each other as they celebrate the treaty and the division of spoils. I think if you think back over the whole period, the other agreements, the relationship we've had has been very significant, very important. But this is really unique and uniquely important. And uh, for that reason, it's really quite an uh, historic occasion that we're now witnessing today. They could at least be more discreet about it. <laughs> it was so obvious that you know, they were ripping off the wealth of East Timor. First, Indonesia invade East Timor, and Australia recognized uh, that uh, invasion, that annexation, saying that it is for the good of the people of East Timor. Australia kept telling us in Indonesia that East Timor is too poor anyway to be viable as an independent state. But then they go on, sign a treaty to exploit the immense oil reserves of the Timor Sea area. It is again a display of uh, audacity, of hypocrisy. It's the blood that they're signing, it's people's blood. The Timorese have had, haven't had a I'd say in it. it, and it belongs to us, it belongs to the people of East Timor, not to Australia or Indonesia. On October the 28th, 1991, an unarmed Timorese student, Sebastio Gomez, was shot dead at this church by Indonesian agents. Here, he is mourned by his friends and his mother. 
tai tai Two weeks later, on November the 12th, the people of Dili, the capital, held an extraordinarily brave demonstration as a tribute to the dead boy. It was also a cry for freedom that the Indonesians did not want the outside world to hear. What was unusual was that the terrible events that followed were witnessed by foreigners and were filmed. So November demonstrations was organized by me and our intention to do this was uh, only to tell to the world that we still continue uh, suffering uh, under Indonesian oppression. And the peaceful demonstrations for us is the only one way. The demonstrators arrived in the cemetery in Santa Cruz. All of the people shouted out for free East Timor and no provocation at all. And Indonesian opened fire. forget it. The military shot a girl and her head was separate and I jumped and uh, I always remember her face. Always in my mind, I, I cannot forget it. And the boys died everywhere. The statement by Amnesty International described the situation there as one of arbitrary arrest, torture, disappearance, executions and massacre. Uh, are they lying? Yes, uh, I think... Uh, they, Amnesty is lying, really. They are not... Uh, uh, they have no uh, corroborated evidence. Maybe they, are, they have uh, letters uh, written by those who are anti-integration. I must admit that there are few of the East Timors who, who still mm -hmm. Uh, don't want to have the integration. Uh, General Sutrisno, who's now of course the Vice President, said that anyone who doesn't toe the line in Indonesia will be shot and we will shoot them. But despite of that statement, have you seen the people being shot? Because No, but uh, we've seen clearly on television people being shot. Uh, it was filmed in the uh, Santa Yes, Cruz of course, that Cemetery. was the incident of uh, 12th November. And we have done a lot to uh, rectify, to address this problem. And uh, of course, uh, again, uh, the Western media, some of the Western media uh, did not have any intention to disclose what uh, had been done by the Indonesian government to address these uh, abuses. What was done was to set up an inquiry described by Amnesty International as totally lacking credibility. Ten low-ranking Indonesian officers were given light sentences, mostly of a few months. In contrast, eight Timorese demonstrators were given sentences ranging from five years to life. The Indonesians are highly sensitive and feel that, um, uh, that uh, uh, journalists may well 
caused further trouble. This happened, of course, after the massacre in 1991. When you say the journalists caused trouble after the massacre, uh, surely the trouble was caused by the Indonesians who killed all those people. Uh, well, uh, and that for the for, for no, it was a rare occasion yeah. they were actually filmed yeah. killing them. Yeah, I don't know the truth of this, but well, the, the truth is there in uh, yeah. living no, no, colour. No, they were the, the, Indonesian soldiers murdering uh, no, 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 uh, young I, people. I hadn't, I hadn't finished. I don't know the truth of the Indonesian allegation. I see that some of those journalists were there on tour, tourist visas and had. Uh, played a part in the stirring up of the trouble. But isn't it... Now, isn't that doesn't justify what happened. Well, that, that's uh, simply... I'm, are you really mm. putting that forward, that no, journalists no, were stirring up trouble uh, that led to the Dili massacre? I'm not putting it forward. I'm the saying Indonesians that, are. Yes. Although there was some graphics uh, picture of the massacre coming through and still the Australian government waited to see whether it really happened, whether the death toll was correct. After the cemetery massacre, the British government increased aid to Indonesia to £81 million, a rise of 250%. At the same time, 11 more contracts under the Timor Gap Treaty were awarded to Australian companies. Gareth Evans described the massacre as an aberration. I think what Gareth meant by an aberration was that uh, it had erupted in Dili, which in uh, is one of 27 Indonesian provinces with uh, elements of the armed forces in it, and it was not uh, directed from Jakarta. I don't think the killing of, as, of perhaps as many as 180 people is an aberration. I think, think that was an extraordinary statement by Garth Evans. I believe it was a deliberate step by the Indonesian military to show the young Timorese that their moves uh, towards agitating for self-determination and independence just simply weren't acceptable. I think they have planted the massacre before. The Indonesian army threatened the people openly at that time. In October, uh, September to October, they came to people, people uh, houses and said that, well, if you do any demonstrations, we will kill you. We have interviewed a number of people who have given evidence that the survivors of those killings in 1991, many of them, were themselves killed. Uh, that is completely untrue. That is completely untrue. Why should these people lie to us? Uh, you know, we have uh, names and places, and these are yes. people with, without, uh, who, who actually speak to us in fear of their personal safety. Why should they lie to us? Again, as a political observer, I think uh, you should understand that in politics, you can uh, pursue your, your objective by throwing uh, dirt. You know, this is politics. You know. uh, we should not be too naive. We can now reveal that a second unreported massacre took place that day and the following day, bringing the total number of people murdered and missing to more than 400. After they stopped shooting, those who had survived, the ones who could have been saved because they were only wounded in the legs and arms, they were stabbed with bayonets. The ones still inside the cemetery who were still breathing, but lying on the ground, their heads were crushed with rocks until they died. So you actually saw the Indonesian soldiers bayoneting the survivors, did you? Yeah. They picked up all the bodies, including me, and took us away in a truck. It was a Mercedes. The bodies were loaded onto a Hino Mercedes truck. According to my colleague who himself unloaded the bodies, some of them are still alive. Not all had died. And then they separated us, the wounded from the ones who were not wounded, and we were taken to the hospital. On the way, we were continually beaten. Once at the hospital, they were not unloaded as human beings. They were just pushed down from the truck and spread on the ground. Some of the victims were pretending to be dead. 
But the Indonesians spotted them and drove the truck over their bodies. Even so, not all of them died immediately. Some still survived. And then they took us to the mortuary. There were a lot of my friends who were still alive. They weren't dead. And I saw with my own eyes that amongst the bodies that were piled high like this, there were children, women and old people. But the majority were young, all students. Suddenly I heard steps approaching the door, so I laid down again, pretending to be dead. And then there was an attempt to inject them with sulfuric acid. Because it's really strong, it can kill. But the Indonesian troops didn't do this again because the people screamed so loudly. But it was an attempt to kill them. These medicines were taken from Denkes, the health department. Two soldiers came in. One of them picked up a rock and the other had a jar with some pills. They ordered those who were alive to stand up and the soldier with the rock smashed one of them on the head and his chest. Not long afterwards, he died. <laughs> 